Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon with a balanced saint of mind.com. If you prefer reading and listening, you can check out that website. I post written versions of the videos that I do for my channel. So just as a quick heads up, that probably won't mean a lot to you, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. I am pregnant. I am, by the time this video shows, will be about 13, 14 weeks pregnant. Really all that means for you is you'll probably see me in a ponytail a lot more often. But I thought I'd throw it out there since my stomach will be growing over the next six months. So this week is October 26th through November 1st, and it is Mormon, chapters 1 through 6. In chapters 1 through 6, we see a very rapid decline of the Nephites and Lamanites. And this decline started in 4th Nephi, but it really started to accelerate in the chapters in Mormon. Mormon was about 10 years old when a righteous man named Amron came to him and Amron said, I perceive that you're a sober child. I think you're a good kid. I perceive that you're a good kid, I guess. And Amron tells him that he wants Mormon to observe the people. And when he is older, he is to retrieve the sacred Nephite records and record what he knows about the people, to record what he's seen. So, in chapter 2 of Mormon, M Mormon <laughs> references a prophecy that was made by Samuel. So to me, what that indicates is that he had retrieved the records, and that makes sense because he had already started to record what he'd seen. However, that I just wanted to point out that verse because he referenced the prophet. He had searched the records, he had learned about the records. Now, why do I care so much to bring that up? The reason I want to bring that fact up is because if Mormon had searched the records and read all of them and learned about them, back in 2 Nephi chapter 26, there is a prophecy made that after Christ comes, there will be a period of peace and then the destruction of the Nephites will come. The Nephites will be completely destroyed. And if Mormon had read these prophecies, he had these prophecies before him, and he knew that his people were going to be destroyed. He knew there was no hope, even beyond the fact that he had watched them for years, and he had the spirit of discernment with him. He could tell that they were wicked and that they were not turning to the Lord. Even beyond that, the fact that he had the prophecies in front of him, he knew that there was no hope for his people, that they would be destroyed. And yet, he loved them. He took a break from them for a while, but he came back and he fought for them. He prayed for them, he loved them, he fought for his people, despite the fact that he knew it was a hopeless cause. In fact, when he was 16, he became the leader of the Nephite armies. That was how involved he was in fighting for his people. And when I think about that, <laughs> Hopefully this doesn't indicate too much of my weakness. When I think about that, it actually reminded me of a thought that I had as a missionary, <laughs> and it came at a particularly difficult time. And I distinctly remember thinking, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I can't fall in love with any more people in Indiana and then watch them reject the gospel. It's too hard. I don't want to love anybody else. <laughs> and I remember thinking that because it was painful. It wasn't fun to watch, to fall in love with these people and to teach them the gospel and then to have them reject it. It hurt. And my circumstances were nowhere near what Mormon's was. Mormon knew that his people were hopeless. At least I have a hope that someday these people I love will accept the gospel. Mormon knew that his people would ultimately be destroyed. So why? Why did he fight for them? Why did he love them so deeply? Where did he find the courage to continue to pray and fight for them? There could be a lot of reasons for this. Perhaps he was commanded by the Lord to do so. Perhaps he examined his other options, like disappearing into the wilderness by himself and figured that wasn't the route he wanted to take. There might have been a lot of reasons. One of the reasons that I want to explore is talked about specifically in the chapters is that when you have experienced the love of the Savior, when you are truly and deeply converted, you automatically, it is a natural result to love others. It just happens. Another way of putting this is 
that there are certain characteristics that follow people who are deeply converted to Christ. Naturally happens. It just is a result of following the Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to read a scripture. So this is an experience that Mormon had when he was very young. So this is Mormon chapter 1, verse 15. It says, And I, being 15 years of age and being somewhat of a sober mind, therefore I was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. So not only was Mormon converted, but Mormon felt had the presence of the Savior. He had this incredible experience where he was in his presence and felt of his goodness. That kind of experience, that kind of love that you feel from the Savior, we see it time and time again in the Book of Mormon where people experience the love of the Savior and they change because of it. And just automatically their love starts to expand and extend towards others. The kind of experience the Mor that Mormon had. Even if we are not brought directly into the presence of the Savior, we can have those kinds of experiences where he, we feel his love. And his love will fill in those cracks and those worries and those insecurities and those weaknesses. He'll fill in all of those extra spaces that we can't fill ourselves. And as we are filled up, it is so easy. When our emotional needs are filled, it is so easy to just turn outwards and to give that love to somebody else. When you're really, really excited about something, I'm sorry, I was remember, remembering something. When you're really excited about something, what I was remembering is there was this movie that I fell in love with. It was this really dorky indie film that was filmed in Provo, and I loved it, and I told everybody about it because I loved it. But that's what happens. When you love something so much, it just bubbles up out of you. And that's what happened with Mormon. He experienced the love of the Savior, and what naturally occurred was that he loved his people deeply. Now, have you ever watched somebody flourish under love that they were not previously experiencing? This could happen in a lot of different circumstances, but the one that usually comes to my mind is foster children. Watching a child that was in a dark and dismal place, being placed into a home that is safe and secure, the changes that come over them are incredible. And there's still trauma there because we live in a fallen world. And as much as we try to give love to them, our love is imperfect. And so that trauma will probably be there for most of their lives. But there are immense changes that happen in these children when they are placed in safe and secure homes, especially when it's a baby. When a baby is taken out of dire circumstances and placed into a love, loving, steady home. It is amazing to watch how the baby changes when they realize that if they cry, someone will pick them up. <laughs> it's amazing what happens when somebody experiences love and how it fills them and how they are able to turn outward. Mormon was visited by the Savior, and even though traumatic events were happening around him, he naturally felt love, it changed him. And I want to read another verse. So this is Mormon, chapter 3. You'll have to excuse me, I cry when I think about the foster children. So this is Mormon, chapter 3, it is verse 12. It says, Behold, I had led them. Notwithstanding their wickedness, I have led them many times into battle and have loved them according to the love of God which was in me with all my heart. And my soul had been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was out faith because of the hardness of their hearts. So he didn't have that faith, but he did have that love. He couldn't help himself. He loved his people and he fought for them. So... That kind of love, the kind of love that Mormon was experiencing, what does it look like? And I, that might seem like an odd question, right? We know that one of the characteristics of God is love, but that love, what does it look like? What are the characteristics of that love? And the reason I want to talk about this is because I have often found, not only in others, but I have come to recognize in myself, that sometimes there is this false imitation of love. We think we're loving somebody, or somebody thinks they're being righteous and loving, 
but it is a false imitation. And when we can recognize the false imitation, we can repent and we can experience the kind of love that our Savior would have us experience. And that is the kind of love that will save us. And that is the kind of love that will bring us the happiness that our Savior wants us to experience. And so I want to talk about this real love and then this false imitation of love that I think sometimes we fall prey to without recognizing. The false imitation of love. Sometimes it stems from pity. When somebody is talking about somebody they love, there might be a scoff in their voice. When somebody is talking, talking, talking about somebody, and then they end with a statement that basically can be attributed to that phrase, like, oh, bless her heart, right? I'm going to talk about her, talk about her, talk about her, but bless her heart, I hope she's doing okay. That kind of love can be selfish. It can have an aspect of selfishness where you think like, oh, I'm being so wonderful that I'm dealing with this person. I'm tolerating this person because they're so hard to tolerate. I'm wonderful and I'm loving them. It's condescending. <laughs> and it can be really hard to recognize in ourselves when we think we're doing a good job of loving somebody, but we're not. People can feel when they're being tolerated and not loved. And they can feel when you don't actually have any respect for them. And I know that people make bad decisions, right? We all make bad decisions, but I know that there are some people who make really bad decisions and can be more difficult, right? Like, that's just how life is. That is the fact of the matter. However, we cannot pretend to love them. We can't fool ourselves that we're loving them and put up this facade that we're loving them because it will keep us from actually seeking out that true gift of love that God can bestow upon us for them. Now let me talk a little bit about what that love really looks like. So first, we have received a commandment from our Heavenly Father to love everybody. And I think sometimes that commandment kind of translates into this false imitation of love. Oh, I love everybody, I love everybody, but it is not that feeling that Mormon had where even when he took a break from his people because he couldn't handle their wickedness, he came back because he couldn't help himself from fighting for them. That's what that real love looks like. And when I think of that love, what I think of is a mother who weeps for her child and loves her child even when they go to jail. Or I think of a mother who sees something good in her fallen child or her lost child and hopes beyond all hope for that child, right? That love is something that you feel deeply. It's something you can't let go of. Even when they're making mistakes or they're making these wrong choices, you feel it all the way down deep. It is not tolerating. It is not condescending. You feel it all the way down deep. That is the kind of love that Mormon had bestowed upon him. Mormon obtained this gift of love. And this gift of love, another name for it is charity. We've heard that before. And we have also been commanded to pray for the gift of charity. That is something that is so interesting to me, right? <laughs> and what happens, at least in my experience, when I've prayed for charity, when I have prayed for charity, usually what happens is Heavenly Father starts to open my eyes by the Spirit to a person's circumstances and their situations, and I truly see them for what they are. And once again, that love comes naturally. It just starts to spring out of you. It's not something that you're forced. It is deep and it is true. Um, this kind of love, this charity, it is not easy to develop, even though it's something that we pray for. We are encouraged to pray for with all the energy of our hearts for this kind of love. It's not necessarily easy to obtain. But what I really want to talk about is even after you have obtained it, <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy to feel that kind of love. Loving somebody, truly deeply loving somebody, comes with a measure of joy and happiness but it also comes with a measure of pain, right? I didn't want to love anyone on my mission anymore because it hurt when they rejected the gospel. And it hurt Mormon when his, when his people were wicked. It hurts a mother when her child turns away and 
get sucked into a life that will harm them. I want to read one last verse. And this verse, I guess, is for the people who are experiencing that kind of love. And because they have that kind of love, they are also simultaneously experiencing some pain that is coming with that love. So this is Mormon chapter 2, it's verse 19. And it says, And woe is me because of their wickedness. So this is Mormon lamenting. Woe is me because of their wickedness, for my soul has been filled with sorrow because of their wickedness all my days. Nevertheless, I know that I shall be lifted up at the last day. So there's two very different concepts in there. He's saying, my heart is so sorrowful, sorrowful, is so filled with sadness. Nevertheless, I will be lifted up at the last day. So when we have been able to cast out this false imitation of love within ourselves, when we have learned about another person, if you're struggling with somebody, if you have truly learned about them and really started to feel that natural love come out, that deep, you can't help but love them feeling, sometimes what accompanies it is pain. How did Mormon cope? Mormon coped by the Savior. Even though he was completely surrounded by wickedness, sometimes I think about <laughs> getting on Facebook right now or social media, whatever it might be, all of the scary things that are happening in the world, all the wickedness and the hatred and the fighting. It, <laughs> I don't even know that it compares to what Mormon was experiencing. His people were about to be destroyed. This level of sorrow that he might have been experiencing as he was watching this completely surrounding him. How did he cope? If you are feeling that kind of pain that is associated with that kind of love, how do you cope? It will always come back to the Savior. Your Savior is proud of you for loving these people. He's grateful for you for loving these children who maybe are making choices that will harm them and that will bring great pain into your life as well. I guess the other consequence that comes with being pregnant is I'm going to cry a lot more in these videos. Christ can help you cope. Even when there's no answers, even when Mormon knew his people were going to be destroyed and there was no comfort that was going to come from that, he knew his people would be destroyed. He found peace because of the Savior. There have been experiences in my life, I can think of one specifically, where I was praying and there was no solution for the problem that was surrounding me. And it's true, there's still no solution. Nothing, it's not going to be fixed until the Savior comes again. There's no healing, this situation that I'm thinking of. And as I was praying about it and I couldn't let go of it, I felt peace wash over me still. The Savior can help you feel peace even in the midst of all of this turmoil and pain. I am grateful for his ability to do that. I'm grateful that he chose to perform the atonement so that he could have the power to do that. I'm grateful that he has paid for the mistakes of people I love, that he has paid for my mistakes, and that he has, that he has the power to wipe away all of the problems that my mistakes have caused for other people. I'm grateful for my Savior, Jesus Christ, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.